Okay, everyone. This is Elizabeth Granier, and I am here to start your lecture over Chapter 1 for the Bio 207 hybrid class that I am teaching at Merrimack for the spring 2017 semester. So this content is a kind of a mixture of some slides that I've created as well as information and pictures that come from either the um, the textbook that we are using, which is the 10th edition of Martini and Nath Bartholomew. Some of it does come from the older textbook, because when I originally did all my slides, I had that material, and that was the main textbook at the time. You are welcome to have either book for this class, and, and when the 11th edition comes out, I'm sure we'll move towards it eventually and um, you know, continue onward with the material presented in those books. So week one in this course is going to be chapter one, and then we're going to move into chapter four, tissues, next. So for chapter one, it's a big overview chapter. And so for this lecture today, I want to go over the big concept that we start in chapter one is what is the difference between anatomy and physiology? Some of you that maybe are thinking about going to UMSL or going to Mizzou, part of the way they run their anatomy and physiology classes is you take a two-semester sequence, but you take anatomy only as a class, and then you take a physiology only as a class. My background when I did this class in my undergraduate level at the Air Force Academy, we did it that way too. I took a gross anatomy one semester class and we just did the anatomy portion of all the organ systems. Then we went into a physiology class and did only the physiology part. Um, some of you might be coming into uh, anatomy and physiology and you've had maybe that one semester of anatomy already and we didn't let you jump to bio 208 uh, physiology because unfortunately um, just because you've had anatomy you can't jump into physiology without having the endocrine and the nervous system and that physiology behind those two organ systems is critical to being able to understand a lot of what goes on in cardiovascular, respiratory, urinary and reproduction. So that's part of the reason why we make you repeat sometimes biology 207 here at the Merrimack campus. All right. Um, so we'll go through a little bit of how you go and distinctly separate the material into what is anatomy and what is physiology. The levels of organization are a review. You've maybe had this in high school biology. You've maybe had this in Bio 111. Uh, there are more levels than what we're going to present in this class, but it helps organize the material in what is done at a micro level, so something that's a very small level that you potentially can't see with the naked eye, versus what is done as a, uh, a big level. And it's important because when you start looking at pathologies, some pathologies, some diseases occur because of the the um, issue or the, the defunct gene or the defunct system or whatever is occurring at maybe a cellular level or maybe at an organ level. All right, and then homeostasis is the last concept I want to hit on, and it's a critical piece of how our human bodies work and how they maintain all of their organ systems, all of their cells, all of their tissues to work together to allow the organism to function in the environment around us, okay? So those are our big three objectives for this first part of this first lecture. All right, so... One of your objectives of this course is that if you are asked, you can tell the difference between what is anatomy versus what is physiology. By definition, anatomy is going to be the study of structures of the body. And so when you study anatomy, you study what is this structure? What is this structure made of? Where is it located? And what are the pieces and parts of other structures that are touching or interacting or attached to this piece or structure? So in Anatomy and Physiology 1, we are going to focus on the skeletal organ system. And the skeletal organ system has a lot of structures. It's got 206 bones. So we are going to learn those structures. You are also going to learn that the associated structures between the bones are the joints. So we are going to learn to identify what joint is between which bones. Uh, we are also going to learn muscles. And again, what are the muscles' names? 
So anytime you start labeling something, you are probably doing anatomy. You're not worried about how it works, you're just worried about where is its physical location and what is it made of and what does it look like and what is touching it and what is potentially near it, all right? So most of us probably don't hear about people getting PhDs in anatomy because it's very hard to discover a new structure in the human body. So many of your medical schools, your physical therapy schools are taught now by not necessarily anatomists who have PhDs in anatomy, but they're taught by interdisciplinarians, people that maybe get their PhDs in a microbiology field or a physiology field and then do some type of specialty training to be able to teach uh, gross anatomy. So your true anatomist is slowly in some ways going away uh, or becoming, it's becoming more challenging for them to get degrees in that because again, uh, we're not discovering new bones in the human body. We're not discovering new muscles in the human body. We're not discovering new organs in the human body. We're not discovering new tissues in the human body. So it, um, at least for our human anatomist, it's become a discipline that is very well structured and characterized, and therefore uh, people that want to go in and teach this typically have backgrounds or PhDs in related fields and then take specialty training to teach it, okay? Now, my PhD is in physiology, so I was interested in the study of how things work. So, does the anatomy sometimes influence the physiology? Yes, of course, but I wanted to learn how things work, how can we manipulate the things to work better, to work worse or less efficient, how can uh, we manipulate the organs or the material to change its um, its efficiency to change its function, and how does some organ systems depend and interrelate upon each other. So my background is cardiovascular physiology and exercise physiology, but two key components of regulating the exercise world and the uh, muscle world of the heart is endocrine. So I consider myself strong in endocrine physiology, some of the traditional hormones, because many of those hormones like epinephrine and thyroid hormones and um, your uh, testosterone and your estrogens are very clearly going to influence, along with insulin and glucagon, the fuel that's used by the cells, the muscle cells in the heart and your skeletal muscle, and going to influence the uh, ability of those cells to maybe work better, more efficiently, or not as efficiently, okay? So when someone is telling you, look at this structure, identify indicated feature, they're typically going to be asking you to identify an anatomical term. If we are asking you to interpret material to describe how something works, we're probably going to be asking you something physiology. So in lab, you're going to see a lot of your material is identify indicated feature, identify indicated structure. Uh, and a lot of your labs are going to be very much learning anatomical features, anatomical structures. But we still also ask you to learn EKGs in uh, cardiovascular physiology. And understanding that the P wave of an EKG is the electrical changing, the functional physiology of electricity moving across the ventricles, or not the ventricles, the atrias of your heart, thus creating this blip is somewhat a physiology, all right? Um, in this semester, we're going to talk about some of the endocrine glands and whether or not you are able to have a uh, active metabolism might be due to having correct levels of thyroid hormones. So that's kind of a physiological mechanism. Being able to get pregnant, being able to ovulate or produce sperm, again, is going to, in some ways, fertility. It's not that you don't have your organs of the reproductive system, it's that their physiology might not be correctly working and that might not be correctly working because of the endocrine system or because of something within the cells physiology-wise responding to those endocrine hormones and producing the gametes. 
Okay? So anatomy is structure, physiology is function. All right, so anatomy, we can look at them in a few different ways. Typically, you're going to take, if you go into professional medical degrees and fields, a gross anatomy class. So you want to look at the human body at a macroscopic level. So with your eyes, you want to see those physical structures. You want to see surface features that are external on the organism. You want to see uh, regional anatomy within certain areas, maybe inside as well as outside. You want to look at organ system anatomy, uh, systemic anatomy related to the pieces and parts and components of a complete organ system. There are people that do developmental anatomy, so they look at when the egg and sperm become a, um, an embryo, what then does that embryo become? to be due to become a fetus and then the fetus to become a baby outside of the mother and then a baby through the different stages of its life. So toddler, puberty, young adult, regular adult, menopause, you know, geriatric. Now, anatomy can be done at a microscopic level. And remember I told you, for the most part, people that now teach maybe gross anatomy or have anatomy type backgrounds might have an interdisciplinary type of microscopic background. Uh, we still are learning a lot about cells and about the components and structures within the cell. So there is still a lot of research looking at microscopic anatomy of what are the proteins, the protein structures on cells, inside cells. Uh, and we still are learning a little bit in some organisms out there. Um, there are different cells that differentiate into specific tissues, and so the histology of those organisms. Okay. Physiology on the other side is how things work. And so if an organism is a single cell or you want to, within a big organism, look at certain cells and how they work, you're going to study things at a physiology level that is at the cell level. Okay? If you put a bunch of cells together, you're going to have certain cells specialized to do certain features and put a few of those tissues together and you can get an organ. And so if we want to study how the kidney works, the kidney is made up of a few different cell types that are specialized to do a few different features and whether or not they work together to accomplish all of those functions at a cellular level will determine if the organ works. And then you put the kidneys along with the bladder and the ureters together and whether or not your kidneys work and then your body can get the urine made in the kidneys to the bladder and then out of the body is all about does your urinary tract work. Um, so that's where you get to the systemic level. And then a pathological level is typically once we have a good understanding of normal body physiology and how all the organ systems work, when we start adding changes to those systems. Changes can occur anywhere from one gene being expressed incorrectly or malfunctioning all the way up to the entire organs beginning to see major cell death and large numbers of cell death in that organ mean it can't function at an organ level and therefore starts to see systemic problems. You start to study the pathological physiology. What are the symptoms, what are the diseases that become apparent because of the damage that's occurring, whether at a single protein level all the way up to the entire system or organ level, okay? Usually, to take a class in pathophysiology or pathology, you have to usually prerequisite have your anatomy and physiology one, two, or physiology class um, finished, all right? And for many people in medical school, you take a year of um, medical physiology, medical uh, anatomy, uh, gross anatomy, and then you go into, after you've completed that first year, you go into medical pathology and medical pharmacology. So being able to, one, understand what diseases come about means you have to understand how the human body works without disease, and then how to treat those pathologies in many cases, what drugs to give or what to do comes into, again, understanding pharmacology related to pathology. Okay. Now, the levels of organization, I've kind of hinted that we study things in the human body at a certain level. So 
chemically speaking, you, all of your chemists are looking at things at a microscopic level, a molecular level, and looking at it as one of the smallest particles of, uh, out there, which is an atom. So in chemistry class, you learn about atoms. And atoms are made up of protons and neutrons and electrons. And because of the number of protons and neutrons and electrons, they have a certain um, organization to them and a certain features and they have so many orbital rings of electrons and you learn that atoms combine together to form molecules and molecules like water have two hydrogens and an oxygen and they are formatted in a certain shape because of the way the electrons are shared and that's chemistry. And a little bit of chemistry is important. Um, we have a whole field of biochemistry where we study the major molecules that are found in the human body. So we study glucose, we study phospholipids, we study fatty acids, we study proteins, we study DNA, because those are major molecules made of atoms uh, in a certain way repeatedly in cells and in the human body. And again, problems at that biochemical level could lead to pathological diseases, OK? Now, for the human body, we start to say life begins at a cellular level. And so your human body is made up of millions and billions of cells. And each of those cells individually uh, is, an, is a life force, has a life force, and can die or propagate and continue on in many cases. Um, when we look at the human body, we have a variety of cells located within us. We have immune cells. We have um, skin cells. We have heart cells. We have muscle cells. We have neurons in our brain. And so the cells represent, um, because of the different groupings of genes and atoms and molecules and proteins, they can specialize into doing certain features. And when we start seeing lots of cells specialize in a certain manner, we get the in the human body, the four tissue types, OK? Now, most of you hopefully have received some cellular um, biology through your high school biology classes and your Bio 111. So in this class, we skip cells and we get to tissues specific to the human body. So we're going to focus on the four tissues found in the human body, and that's week two. When you start putting a few, two or three tissues together, uh, you can start to create organs. And you have very distinctive organs in your body that work as a group to perform a specific function. So we are going to learn there are organs, and within the organs, two or three or more working together, you get an organ system. Now, our book can say we have 11 organ systems, or it can say it has, we have 12 organ systems. It really comes down to reproduction is one organ system. Uh, do you differentiate that the male and female reproductive systems are different? And our book says there are 11, so they're saying reproduction, and then it's subdivided into male and female. You go to a different book, whether you go to Hole's book, Patton's book, um, some of the other big anatomy and physiology, Guyton, Tortora, they might organize that we have 12 organ systems, and they do differentiate that there's a female reproductive organ system and there's a male reproductive organ system. Okay. Put all of the organ systems together, and we get a human or an organism. All right. Um, that's misspelled there. It should have the organism. So there are more levels of organization. Put a bunch of org uh, humans together. You can get a community. You get a group. You get an ecosystem. You get an earth. You get a biosphere. Uh, again, that becomes important in ecology, in your field biology work, and we're not quite worried about that because at this class we're focusing on a little bit of the chemistry into cells, into tissues, all the way up to organ systems that combine together to form a human. All right. Now, how am I going to ask this on a test? I may ask you to fill in the blank uh, from smallest to largest, uh, fill in the missing level of organization. So I'll say cell, I'll say tissue, blank, organ system, human. Um, and so I would expect you then to fill in that the organ level is the one that's missing, okay? I might ask you to put them in order from largest to smallest or smallest to largest. So there's a few different ways. It's a list um, that I can ask this. Or I might give you what a definition is and ask you to provide the level of organization that it fits, okay? 
So again, here's kind of the, the gist. The organ systems, I do expect you to know all 12 by proper name. So integumentary, skeletal, muscular, nervous, and endocrine are the organ systems we are going to cover in AMP1. And we are going to go into more depth following this first test, all right? But I expect you for test one and lab one to be able to, by name, name all of the organ systems and proper names. So we don't always say it's the, uh, it's the goopy gop system. You know, it's not the, the goopy gop of the nervous system. It's the nervous system. All right? I don't say it's the communication system. I say specifically I'm talking about long-term communication, the endocrine system, short-term communication, the nervous system. All right? I don't call it the pumping system. It's the cardiovascular system. All right? And within each of these organ systems, you need to know the major organs, and they are listed in Chapter 1, and they're listed in your lab manual. And then you need to know the main function. So if I'm to ask you a question, lung is too blank as heart is too cardiovascular, just like on your ACT and SAT, I'm giving you an organ and asking you what, what system it belongs to similar to how I'm giving you an organ and I'm telling you which system it belongs to. So lung is to respiratory as heart is to cardiovascular. I'm going to maybe give you questions where I give you a function. So fluid balance, which is related to your urinary system, um, is going to be that answer to the second question. And mammillary glands. So mammillary glands, which are your breast tissue, are anatomically speaking part of your integument, your skin. But they don't have a physiological function in the integument system. They have a physiological function as part of the reproductive organ system. And for reproduction, again, you can be more specific and say the female reproductive system. Okay? So the last part of this lecture I want to go through is a big overall concept of anatomy and physiology that we as anatomy and physiologists, our human organisms, have to live in a certain environment. And to live in a certain environment, there are certain conditions that need to exist to make the body work at an optimal or an efficient way. And so what is that called, keeping the body within these guidelines or these ranges for um, different specifications is that we need to keep the body in homeostasis, okay? And homeostasis means that the body will work at a certain efficiency because it's a stable internal environment, all right? Now, somewhere along the evolutionary lines, we developed cells, and cells decided that they wanted to have a watery internal environment. So they wanted to suspend all of their organelles, all of their proteins, all of their biochemical molecules in a watery background material. They could have chose a fat material. They could have chose a lipid-based material, like an oil, uh, but they didn't. They chose water. And so one of the things then when you took, take all of these cells and put them together is that in order to have the right internal stable environment, every cell needs to have a certain amount of water content. And so one of the big keys to maintaining a stable internal environment for our bodies is that we have to have a certain amount of water inside our bodies at any given point in time. And we know that water can evaporate, water can freeze. So the temperature of the internal environment needs to be a certain amount so that the water levels are maintained and water is not transitioning to a solid state or transitioning to a gas state. All right, so two big things we do is maintain our body temperature and our fluid balance. We need to maintain our energy balance, making sure that the amount of energy we bring in is equal to the amount of energy we expend. Otherwise, we gain in size or we lose size as, a, as an entity. So there are lots of other pieces of homeostasis, but the big one is water and temperature. Now, we don't want to make ourselves stay on a fixed point. So we don't want to make our temperature stay on a fixed degree. We want to give ourselves a little bit of, of leg room, a little bit of range to kind of transition in. And so you're going to find that most of our homeostasis is that I want to be within one or two degrees of a set point. 
I want to be within a certain uh, percentage of 1% higher, 1% lower body water levels. And so what happens in this kind of mechanism is that we allow ourselves to float a little bit above our set point, float a little bit below our set point. And when we start to get outside of that range, we then need to regulate ourselves back into the range. And our mechanisms of regulation can be little things internally that are happening in the cells, in the tissues, or in the organs, where they manipulate maybe the ion, the solute concentration. They manipulate their energy expenditure, energy release, energy hoarding uh, to control the, the temperature of the cellular environment. Um, or it can be more big terms, you know, if I'm beginning to lose too much water, I am going to then bring physically in water by drinking. If I'm cold, I am going to try to add more layers of insulation by putting more clothes on. So some of the responses can be driven by nervous and endocrine systems and behavioral changes that occur because of that. I get thirsty. I get cold, so I try to warm up, all right? Or it can be something is going on at a cellular level, and maybe conscious awareness isn't isn't in tune to it, but cells are making small little changes to try to make the entire organism as a whole then be able to better handle the internal environment that in certain conditions, OK? So most of the time when we talk about maintaining homeostasis, we do what's known as we have a range. And when you get out of that range, you work to bring it back into range. And this type of feedback and mechanism of control is known as negative feedback. So if I want to be um, 37 degrees Celsius, any time I try to get above 38 degrees Celsius or below 36 degrees Celsius, I do things at an intrinsic cellular level and I do things at a whole body level that are going to try to raise the temperature if I fall below or decrease the temperature if I fall outside of the high level. That whole system is known as negative feedback. And the majority of how you work to maintain homeostasis is done through negative feedback. Now, components of maintaining a negative feedback loop usually include that somewhere in the body, there are some cells, there's some little entity that sets your control center. The majority of the time, all of your homeostasis set points are set in your hypothalamus of your brain. All right, and so the example to relate this to an example in the room around us is the thermostat is somewhat like the brain that has the cells that are setting your set point. Now, they might say, I want to set the room at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Your brain is saying, I want to set your internal temperature to be 37 degrees Fahrenheit, which is around, or degrees Celsius, which is around 98 degrees um, Fahrenheit, OK? Now, in order to know what temperature you currently sit, there has to be some sensors. So some type of sensor or receptor is located in the room to be able to say what is the current temperature. And you have sensors, temperature sensors, throughout your body that are able to tell what is the temperature of the skin, what is the temperature of the heart, what is the temperature of the blood. And based upon all of that information from those receptors, your thermostat, your hypothalamus, is getting information to say we're sitting at 72 degrees. We're sitting at 37 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, Celsius, 98 degrees in our body. If we start to ask cells to do a lot of activity, the energy expended in the body starts to increase. And as we increase and break energy molecules in the form of ATP, and we harness that energy to do work, not all the energy, because we're not perfect machines, is harnessed. So we start to lose energy as heat, and heat will start to accumulate. So if heat starts to accumulate and our thermostat receptors, our temperature receptors in our body start to see that there are a lot more heat being generated in the room and then we want available in the room, we then will do certain effective mechanisms to alter that. We'll shift the way the blood is distributed. We're going to try to allow more blood to bring more heat to the surface of our skin, flushing our skin. We are going to try to take off clothing so that way we have more of our bare skin in contact with the outside environment. We'll try to get con 
subduction going, wind blowing on our skin to help bring more energy away from our bodies. And this is similar to how a thermostat will see that the room is getting warmer than it should and will start to turn on the fan to blow cool air into a room. Okay, so you can see that this system requires, for negative feedback, it requires some place to be the control switch. It requires receptors throughout the entire organism to monitor and provide feedback on what is the, the system sitting at and is it falling in the range it's supposed to or falling outside of that range. And when it falls out of that range, the system needs to be able to decrease and bring the high range back to into normal or needs to increase and potentially bring the low range back into normal, right? And it gets the word negative feedback because if it's hot, to be able to get back to normal, it does the opposite. It tries to cool things down. And if it's cold, it tries to warm things up. That's where negative comes into play. Now, there are other types of feedback mechanisms known as positive feedback mechanisms. Now, these are very rare because what goes on in a positive feedback loop is if I want something to happen and that is going outside of normal range, I want it to get bigger and more strong and more, you know, pronounced of, of a loop so that way I can make something happen more robustly. So examples of a positive feedback loop are birth. So once the birthing process starts and you start to want to push the baby out and you start getting bigger contractions, the contractions are going to get bigger and quicker and faster until the baby is gone. So it's a positive feedback loop because you will continue to make strong, short, really big contractions until the stimulus of the baby in the womb is removed. All right, so that is kind of an example of a positive feedback loop. And trust me, you don't want labor to stop midpoint, all right, especially if you're full term because you want to get that baby out. Another type of positive feedback loop is the clotting process. If I break my artery or break my vessels, I want clotting to happen quickly and I want the proteins and the platelets to stick and stick very quickly and stick in robust amounts so that way I can plug the hole, all right? And so for a short period of time, clotting is a positive feedback loop, okay? Most of your loops are negative, temperature, water, um, hormone levels, and how much uh, circulating hormone you have is because of, in many cases, a negative feedback loop. All right, so for homeostasis, the big areas that we tend to regulate, and so therefore the areas that have very pronounced feedback um, receptors, feedback effectors, and control points in the hypothalamus are going to be body temperature, so that we maintain all of the cells in the body around 98 degrees Fahrenheit. If it gets too high, we work on getting it to come down by producing heat loss and cooling effects. If the temperature gets too low, we work through a variety of systems to bring the temperature up by creating heat and distributing it, all right? Another thing, again, is going to be body fluid composition. So our cells have decided we want a water background. So every cell needs to have a certain amount of water inside it and a certain amount of water outside it. And suspended in that water needs to be certain ions and certain proteins. And so being able to make water flow into cells or flow out of cells is a work of making sure there's water available in the system coming in through the mouth, being taken out by the urinary, that you balance that. And then you balance the solutes, the nutrients, the ions, the protein levels in cells and out of cells to be able to drive osmosis, moving water in or moving water out. All right. Um, again, body fluid composition. Some cells want the internal environment to be full of certain ions like potassium and certain proteins and they want to keep out other ions, calcium and sodium and chloride. So being able to manipulate that comes down to a variety of organ systems making sure that we take in the right amount and lose the right amount. Okay. Uh, waste production, anytime our cells start to make waste, like we need to break down proteins, so we create urea. We need to break down some RNA, so we create some other nucleic nitrogen waste. We need to then get rid of those wastes. Uh, and so our body has to be able to take in proteins to replenish the ones that we maybe broke down and made 
too much urea waste and got rid of versus we need to be able to take in and remove if we have excess waste, okay? And the last big system we regulate is blood pressure. And you will learn in, in the pathology world that most of us tend to get high blood pressure and then stay high blood pressure. And the system can be reset. The system is not perfect. There are a lot of redundant pathways. Same with weight management. And so while we try to regulate this and keep it in a certain normal level, the system can, with redundant pathways, reset, recalibrate, and start to stay at a higher level or a lower level and not be as manipulative with long term. Yes. All right. So. Going back into what we've accomplished in the, um, this lecture, we needed to understand the difference between anatomy and physiology, structure and function. We needed to understand the levels of organization and learn our 12 organ systems and learn our major organ systems organs and learn their major functions. And we need to understand homeostasis, what it is, how do we keep it, and what are the main things we try to manipulate into homeostasis through positive and negative feedback loops. So that is uh, part one of chapter one. I'll finish up part one of chapter one um, in this another video, and then we'll move onward into chapter four. Okay, if you have questions, come to lab or feel free to email me uh, those questions.